Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Julia Torres, and I am going to be reading to you today from a book called Prairie Lotus by Linda Supark. Um, I do identify as anti-racist, which means I am continually struggling, working, growing to develop in my knowledge of what it means to overcome the racist thought patterns, structures, and other, um, other oppressive issues in society that start internally, but then extend to the world that we live in. Um, I'm joining you today from the corner of my bedroom. So should you hear a dog bark or any other loud noise, please forgive me. But um, my children are downstairs and I decided to let them have the downstairs for now and be upstairs. So um, before I begin, I do want to recognize that there is, um, along with uh, Prairie Lotus being nominated for a major award, there is some criticism right now of the book and its portrayal of Native people. And I want folks to understand that my perspective on this, and I, I am by no means um, as credentialed or as much of a, a scholar of kid lit as I would like to be. But I can tell you that from my perspective and experience, um, the book has some value for helping us understand the West um, from some different perspectives. Uh, we often talk about the West being one. It was not one, it was colonized. Um, we often talk about the West being settled. We refer to people as settlers. Um, which implies that things were unsettled before they got there. And so a lot of the language that we use to talk about the way that America as a country and its people um, expanded into the West really erases identities and is dehumanizing and ignores some truths like the fact that the genocide of Native people happened and continues to happen to this day. So as we read this book, I hope that folks will pay attention to both the praise and the criticisms of Prairie Lotus and participate in the development of a critical consciousness, which means that you are learning to evolve as a person so that you cannot block out um, racist messaging or um, language that is just kind of commonplace. Um, for a lot of us, but you will learn to see them for what they really are, which is a part of the structures that keep us all from being free and have led to, you know, the genocide of um, of Native people in this country specifically, but all over the world as well, when we think about um, Aboriginal people in Australia, for example. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk to you about today is what drew me to Prairie Lotus. I was given a copy in the fall when Linda Sue Park presented with um, me and my Disrupt Text partners in crime, Lorena Hidman, Trisha Abarvia, and Dr. Kim Parker. And one of the things that struck me is that, of course, I, like many people, read The Little House on the Prairie books when I was young. And I didn't really question some of the racist tropes in those books. And I just thought it was kind of a quaint little story about what the West was like. As I have grown in my racial consciousness and as a woman, um, and I've been to the Colorado History Museum and learned there too. So I had to go out and seek knowledge. It wasn't just that it came to me. Um, I learned that, you know, Colorado, for example, was part of Mexico for a very long time, and that there were people in Colorado who were mixed race, who had intersecting identities. So it's not just a case of white people, and then everyone who's non-white kind of gets grouped into a massive um, group of otherness. There were people who had intersecting identities, as the protagonist of Prairie Lotus does. She is um, Chinese and white, and, you know, one of the things that draws me to it as well is that I have a close friend who is Hmong and her children identify as half Asian and half white. And so I kind of wanted to read the book to try to understand a little bit more of what it might be like to um, live in a world that sees you as other, but then, you know, some folks are easier, more able to um, have proximity to whiteness and potentially white power structures than others. Um, so without further ado, because I don't want to go too long on that um, strain, I think that children who identify as multiracial or biracial might be interested in this book. I would recommend 
or really strongly recommend that everyone um, read this book with a critical eye and think about the way that we talk about and idealize what happened in the West and what continues to happen. The destruction of the environment by quote unquote settlers being one of those things. So um, think about that, talk about that please with your students. Um, and you know, let's move beyond Laura Ingalls Wilder's idealization of what happened to our West. And let's think also about the intersection of identities. So Prairie Lotus by Linda Sue Park. I read Asian. I think it might be backwards for you, that, but maybe not. Um, that cover that I just showed you, I'm not sure if it'll be backwards or not. But it begins in Dakota Territory, April 1880. Should be our last day, Papa said when they stopped to make camp. He unhitched the tired horses from the wagon, then led them down a little draw to water while Hannah began clearing the ground for a fire. They had journeyed for almost a month since leaving Cheyenne, their most recent stretch in near three years of travel, three years without a real home. Tomorrow they would reach their destination, La Forge, a railroad town in Dakota Territory. Hannah was looking forward to cooking supper. They had been able to buy groceries in North Platte, but since then it had rained for almost a solid week. They'd had to make do with meal after meal of stale biscuit and cold beans. She had put dried codfish to soak the night before. Soup, she thought, with onions and potatoes. Papa, or maybe it's Papa, returned with the horses and a bucket of water. He fastened the horses to their picket lines, then left again to gather some brushwood. I'm gonna make soup, she told him as, she, as he started the fire. About time we had a hot meal, he said. Hannah bristled at the note of petulance in his voice. The dreary weather of the past week was hardly her fault, but she said nothing, not wanting to start a row. I'll see if I can shoot us a duck or a rabbit or something, he said, mind the fire. He went off with his gun on his arm, his long-legged strides covering ground quickly. Hannah watched him until he vanished behind a low rise. The endless prairie looked flat at first glance, but the land was never completely level. Rain had rinsed the gray and beige plains, leaving behind a translucence of green that was growing denser every day. She went into the wagon and opened her trunk. She took out a piece of plain brown wrapping paper, a pencil and rubber eraser, and a well-worn magazine. The paper had been folded accordion style several times and folded across twice. Opened out, the creases formed rectangles about two inches wide and three inches tall, three dozen of them. Hannah had used up about half the rectangles on one side of the paper. In each was a small pencil sketch of a dress, house dresses, visiting dresses, dresses for church, even ball gowns. She had seen pictures of ball gowns in the Goatee Ladies Book magazine, and it was fun to draw the elegant garments, even though she would never have a chance to see or wear one. Now she leafed through last summer's issue of Goatees, the latest she had been able to get. On page after page, there were drawings of every kind of garment. Some were re available ready-made. For others, paper patterns and instructions could be mail ordered. She found pictures of two gowns that interested her. She took up her pencil and began to draw, combining the bodice of one dress with the skirt of the other. She also added a trimming of braid around the cuffs and hem of the bodice. She eyed the drawing critically. Something wasn't quite right. The skirt was too full for the length of the bodice. She erased the skirt and drew it again, this time with a slimmer profile. Yes, better. For the past three years, Hannah had done all the family sewing. Papa bought his coats and jackets. She made his trousers, overalls, shirts, drawers, and nightshirts, as well as her own dresses and undergarments. Using paper patterns that had belonged to Mama, she knew how to adjust a pattern to the correct size. She could backstitch, whip stitch, sew buttonholes. When she hemmed a garment or added trimming, her stitches were nearly invisible. With all that experience behind her, she was confident that she could make a dress of her own design, and she intended to try very soon. She loved sketching because it took all her attention. She could stop thinking about the rest of the world for a while. As for sewing, most of the time, it was both soothing and satisfying. She hadn't been able to draw or sew for several weeks now. Riding in the wagon, it was too bumpy for fine work. And by the time they stopped to camp, it was almost always too dark. Before long, she had to put away her drawing things to cook for supper. She took the three-legged cast iron spider from its hook on one of the wagon bows. It was deep enough to make soup for two people. Spider in hand, she jumped to the ground, took a few steps and stopped in mid-stride. A group of Indians stood in a loose semicircle between the wagon and the fire. Hannah had seen Indians from the wagon several times, but always at a distance. At such moments, Papa seemed watchful, but not particularly worried. 
He told her that the government had forced the Indians in this region, most of them members of the Sioux tribe, off the wide open prairie and onto tracts of land reserved for them. They were not allowed to leave that land without special permission from the reservation's Indian agent. Hannah looked over the group quickly. Three women, the eldest with gray streaked hair, a girl a few years younger than Hannah, and two little girls. The women were wearing faded blankets or shawls. They carried cloth sacks or bundles. One had a baby tied to her back. Mothers and daughters, Hannah thought, at once of mama. What would she say or do if she were here? So a few things that I want to um, call attention to. At first, when you begin reading this book, I think that the author does a very good job of connecting the time period to what we might remember, those of us who might have read the Little House books. However, it is important to note as we are reading them now in 2020, or we're reading this book now in 2020, there is commentary about Indians, there is commentary about the roles of men and women, and there is commentary about how life worked, detail that was different than the way that we live now. So I think that detail will be interesting to, to students or to young people. I think that page five is a prime and appropriate moment for folks to talk a little bit about the way that we portray the Native American people. There are many, it's not just a homogenous group of Indians, um, but how we portray them in stories about the West. And I love the fact that Hannah is thinking a lot about her family connections, but she's also thinking about how she operates in the world, which would be appropriate for a girl of her age. So one of the things that I know as an adult woman now is that I grew up even watching Rodgers and Hammerstein musicals, knowing now that those were horrifically racist. It is important to me as an educator to continually check in with myself about the things that I'm reading and about the messages that they might be portraying. And then also about how my own experiences with oppression might cause me to prioritize what I know to be oppression over what someone else has experienced as oppression. So we have to make sure that we are talking about these things in our classes and that is part of the anti-racist work. So this story talks about a group, um, it talks about multiple groups of non-white, people, but it also talks about that intersection, someone who is half white, half Chinese. And so, as we know, many of the students in our nation, in the United States and out, identify as mixed race or biracial. So I think this is a really great opportunity to talk about the fact that that's not a new thing and that that has existed from before present day. Um, as I mentioned before, I went to the History Colorado Museum and learned about people who were half native and half black, who were half Mexican and half white. There are all kinds of um, different groups of people and subgroups that existed. And we have to recognize that, um, that they were real. And this story, I believe, um, brings one of those stories to light. It is fiction, but I think that it gives a imagination or an imaginative um, perspective of a little known group of people or a little known identity marker. Um, and I don't know if my language is perfect, it never is, but um, I recommend that people read this book in its entirety and discuss this book and read the criticism as well as the praise. Okay, Julia Torres, I read Asian, thank you.